This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, so I'm going to focus mainly about on digitisation and some of the values and benefits that that can bring. Uh, I'll explain a little bit about where I come from so you have a context in terms of the Department of Digital Humanities and some of the ways that we integrate, interact with um, history in particular and then I'll use that as an example um, that will take us through the talk. So um, as was introduced, I'm from the Department of Digital Humanities. Uh, we're interested in the application of digital technologies to humanities disciplines or as I like to sort of think about it, it's about you know, how do humans affect computers and how do computers affect humans is the sort of theme that often runs through a lot of our projects and a lot of our engagements. And um, uh, we have over 50 academics and researchers in the department with around about um, 2.5 million in research income uh, at any given time. And uh, last year we actually did a bit of an audit and found that we had five, over 5 million digital objects across 107 projects that we've been running for the last 20 years or so. And uh, in the last five years, those objects had received uh, over 200 million hits. Uh, and you take out all the, uh, that's having taken out all the, uh, the bots and engines and, and attacks. And um, the reason I show you this is to give you an idea of scale. I don't want you to think that this is in any way me saying, look at what, how much impact we have. These are not impact measures. I'll talk about impact measures a bit later on. What they are are measures of scale. In some ways, what I like about these last two numbers is, is that we're kind of in the weird situation of being an academic department that in many ways operates uh, curatorial, should operate curatorially the way a museum operates in the sense that we have a large number of digital objects that we have gathered and created and curated over a number of years and now they're being used by a surprisingly large amount of people. Um, it would have to be said, for instance, that one of our projects, um, the, uh, the fine rolls of Henry III, uh, accounts for about five million hits a year. And that's the fine rolls of Henry III. You know, so there's surprising audiences out there. You know, it can't all be academics. You know, there's got to be uh, a group of, if you like, you know, people who are just lifelong learners and people just interested in the subject who keep coming back to these, these areas. Um, but we have a, a very strong relationship also. One of the things that Willem McCarty did um, uh, is establish some really interesting and innovative relationships such that students don't have to come and do a PhD in digital humanities and that's it. They can do a joint PhD, so they can do a, do a PhD in history and digital humanities or digital humanities and history or digital humanities and philosophy or digital humanities and theology. And one of our students um, uh, wrote off to PhD comics and uh, uh, they built this, uh, this video together which is a can you describe your PhD in two minutes and it's a wonderful expression of, of really how what we do in digital humanities touches on history and then how that reflects back into this aspect and is a good, uh, a good expression of what digitisation does for us as well. Can you describe your thesis in two minutes? Most people think historians spend all their time in the library reading books and wouldn't be far off. But recently, the library has gotten too big, way too big, and it's getting bigger at an alarming rate. That's because billions of records have been digitized and are now online. Historians are faced with far more material than they could ever hope to read in a lifetime, or even a hundred lifetimes. My research looks at a pretty typical historical question. How were Irish immigrants to London, England treated at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution? But instead of heading to the library, I'm heading to my computer to apply some of the best tricks of computer science to the task, namely distant reading. Distant reading basically means figuring out what something says without actually reading it. It's the type of classifying that Google does to help you find a recipe for an apple pie. Google hasn't read those web pages. Instead, they've created a computer program that does it for them. I'm doing the same thing, but instead of focusing on pies, I'm asking questions like, which documents refer to Irish people? Like Google, I've developed a set of computerized tests to determine if a document is relevant or if it's not. That automation is crucial when you're dealing with databases containing hundreds of millions of words of text. But finding relevant material isn't all we can do in the age of the internet. Computers have also allowed me to measure aspects of 19th century life in which the Irish experience differed from that of a typical Londoner. 
For example, I can tell you that an Irish person was roughly four times more likely than an English counterpart to appear in a London court on trial for his or her life. There's no way we would ever have found that out without distant reading. We live in a world in which information is overabundant, and managing it effectively can mean the difference between finding what you're after and getting lost in a jungle of data. There's too much to read out there, so it's time we found another way to do it. My name is Adam Crimble, I'm a student at King's College London in the United Kingdom, and the title of my thesis is Understanding the London Irish Immigrant Experience Through Large-Scale Textual Analysis, 1801-1820. So this is available online. Um, there was a, a really good uh, PhD comic today, which was how do you tell if your academic event, what name should you give your academic event? And uh, so you know, if you're charging people, it's a workshop, if, you know, that, that aspect. So they're really well worth going and looking at. Um, but also there's a, there's, a, there's a certain level of discipline there, you know, in terms of can you describe your PhD in such a short, pithy statement as, as, as that. Um, but it also is, a lot of the stuff that Adam's working on comes out of the old Bailey session papers, out of the, the London Lives, the Plebeian Lives type projects, those activities, and we'll, 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 we'll reflect on those a little bit as we go along. When we talk about digital in this environment, there's some big questions to ask, and I always like to think of this as a, as a way of, of, of thinking our way into some of the problems or thinking our way around some of the issues. So is the value in the wine, the glass, or the drinking? Now, if the wine is the content and the glass is our infrastructure and the drinking is access, where do we put the value? And of course, you know, it's, it's very easy to say, well, the value's in all of those things because none of them can really exist effectively without the others. You know, wine without a glass or some sort of container to carry it is going to be a bit messy. It's quite difficult to, to look after. Certainly, it's very hard to look after and create a vintage wine if you haven't got a container to hold it in. And what's the point of having wine if you're never going to drink it? You know, there's all that aspect like this. You know, you can imagine all these interrelationships. But what I always find is this, that when I'm working with a memory organisation, whether that's a library, museum, archive or publishers, they have a different emphasis. Some of them will be all their focus is on fine wine. It's, it's all about the fine wine, let's keep the fine wine going, etc, etc, etc. Others, it's all about the drinking. Yeah. Can we provide lots and lots and lots of access? We're not all that worried about whether each individual sip that they're having is of the most amazing content they've ever seen. We just want them to be drinking constantly. Twitter would be a good example of that. You know. Uh, it's about the constant drinking, it's not necessarily about each individual sip being a wonderful glass of wine, in that sense, along those lines. And then there's the unsung heroes, those people who look after the glass, who look after the infrastructure, look after keeping something available, making sure that we are able to, to, to engage with those materials. And it's a little thought experiment that, we, that we some, I sometimes use to sort of think to myself, which organisation am I in? Where do they put their value? Um, obviously all three are important, but which, where does it tip for them as an organisation in terms of what are they most interested in? So it's just a way of thinking about some of the problems that we face. And for me, the purpose of digitisation is to educate, enlighten and, and entertain. And I think entertainment is an important factor here. It's often overlooked because we're always looking for some uh, extremely uh, 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 high point of... Uh, of purpose, you know, a purpose which we can uh, be really proud of. We're educating, you know, and it's often we say, well, entertaining, well, that doesn't sound like, you know, something we should be aiming for. But we see that the way that people are using digital content uh, has entertainment uh, featured in there quite strongly. You look at the core reasons why some crowdsourcing projects work, you, know, you ask people, you know, why, why are they engaging with the Australian Li National Library of Australia's uh, newspaper projects and actually uh, correcting and, and, uh, uh, and annotating text there? And when you ask people what this is, you know, there, there, there are folks who are spending 30, 40 hours a week doing this. And you say, well, it's my hobby. This is what I do now. You know, this is what I do for fun. You know, I think the one that really sort of blew my mind was when was was a, was one of their one of their top correctors was a CEO of a technology company, and this is what she did to relax when she got home from work. You kind of went, okay, you know, this is an entertainment thing. It's about those sorts of activities, and so and it's also about creativity as well. And uh, I think one of the things that struck me was when I was working with the archivists at the Tate, and they said, look, we don't want our archives 
to be a source of archaeology where someone just comes around and digs around in the past and goes off and finds things. We actually want them to be a place where we create new things. So if you like, a place of creative architecture where they go, you know, yes, we find out about our past, but we connect that with our future. We think about how we're going to uh, uh, engage with those sorts of ideas going forward. And just to sort of put my heart very firmly on my sleeve, my area of research interest is uh, focused around issues of, of the economics of the digital domain. So how do we trade? What do we trade? Uh, and for me, the attention economy has been one of the most important things um, that's driven some of my thinking in this, in this, in this environment. We could look at eco economics as being the distribution of scarce resources. And how do we distribute scarce resources and share those resources and where do we prioritise those? And so for me, the idea that this is a knowledge or information economy is kind of a bit of a fallacy because the one thing that we're not short of is information and data. What we are short of is accurate information, information we can validate, that we can authenticate, that we know is, is helpful and useful to us, and also our ability to choose our ability to attend to. So when we talk about the attention economy, you know, we're not talking about attention in the sense of uh, a sort of Lady Gaga look at me or a baby crying in their crib. We're talking about our ability to attend to. And we all only have so much attention. There's only so much of our time that we have available to give to any one activity. And so when we put a digital resource out there, whether it's a historical resource, whether it's an archival resource, whether it's a game or an entertainment activity, we are competing for the attention, the time and energy and eyeballs of our uh, consumers out there and our communities. And so we have to engage with this concept of the attention economy. How are we going to make what we do worthwhile of people's attention? How are we going to make our scholarly resource, if we are going to make that scholarly resource available, worth attending to and, so, and spending time on? Or maybe getting our communities to put their energy into it, to help build it, to help make it, to help expand it. Now, the GISC gave me uh, some funding to look at uh, the values and benefits of digital resources. And we produced this, uh, this, this document. Uh, there's, a, there's a sort of glossy version which is available uh, online, which, is, which you give to your senior managers who don't have a great attention span and only a few minutes to read something. And there's a longer version for us practitioners which goes into much more depth about how we can get value and benefit out of this. And this was inspired by the idea that over the last 15 years or so, we have spent in the UK about £100 million on digitisation. That's a lot of money. We will not see that sort of money again. Over the next 15 years, we will not see another £100 million. We will be lucky to see another, another £20 or £25 million of public money spent on digitisation. So there's an element there of how do we express the values and the benefits that we gain from that activity. And we came up with a number of results. Um, of particular interest, I felt, was the idea that by a process of digitization, we were enabling new areas of research. As Tim Hitchcock said about the Old Bailey Online, he said it reaches out to communities such as family historians who are keen to find a personal history reflected in a national story. Digital resources both create a new audience. We found you know, family historians were really interested and excited in this resource and reconfigure our analysis to favour the individual. And this idea that Tim talks about is the idea of history from below, the idea that uh, instead of history being the great swathe of, of social movements, there's this idea that we can actually look at historic, historical resources in more detail because we can have these personal records, these personal stories that were maybe just unachievable to us before. And David Turner talks about this when he reflected on the old Bailey, and he said that allowed him to discover the hidden lives of disabled people who have not traditionally left records of their lives. I found disability was discussed by many writers in the 18th century. And so it's enabled him to see records um, in ways that he couldn't previously. Now, we're always going to be 
um, defined by the, the quality of our questions, but if we have more resources available to us, then maybe we can ask interesting questions that we would have found unfeasible to ask previously, and so that allows us to engage in new areas of research. Welcome. It's also about effective, efficient and world leading. You know, it's about the resources that we have being available to everyone, everywhere. Uh, not requiring people to travel uh, so much to see resources which are spread across a number of, a number of uh, libraries. So the Jane Austen Fiction Manuscripts Digital Edition, which is one of the projects that we're really proud of in, in uh, Department of Digital Humanities. Uh, as Catherine Sutherland, our core collaborator and expert in Jane Austen, said, it offers an unprecedented opportunity for new scholarship, exploring the creative laboratory of her novels, and looking at an under-examined area of Austin studies, making the manuscript sources freely available to the wider public. And those manuscript resources, as an example here, came from over 15 different libraries. So the ability to actually put one of those manuscripts side by side with one of those other manuscripts was really hard to do uh, in the physical world, but being able to do it in the electronic world was quite feasible. I know there are Chaucer manuscripts in Oxford which sit on opposite sides of a road and will never ever be moved from one side to the other to allow you to put them side by side, but you can do that electronically in ways that we couldn't have done. And of course, Early English Books Online has done interesting things as well uh, with a different economic model because the Jane Austen fiction manuscripts is free. Is free. Um, and this has had all sorts of interesting aspects because it's, it has reached a wider public. It's been quite interesting the effect of. Uh, those uh, fiction manuscripts, digital edition, in terms of sort of skewering, if you like, this sort of romanticised idea of how Jane Austen wrote all her books and that she wrote them perfectly straight away and that everything she wrote as it flowed off her pen was this perfect prose with perfect grammar and perfect punctuation. And of course what it shows is that editors had a very strong role in making Jane Austen's book books the books that they are today and, and that helps uh, people to really understand issues of creativity because of course we can get caught up in this sense that um, creativity is, a, is, is, is about one person have, being a genius and everyone else just sort of sitting around doing nothing and just going oh that was nice off you go doing your genius thing. It does mean that Catherine Sutherland now gets hate mail uh, from America's, Americans saying how dare you say that she didn't write perfectly straight away. Um, and that her grammar wasn't uh, absolutely wonderful, uh, but there you go, that's part of the process of people understanding and learning a little bit about the world. So there's some really interesting aspects there of uh, uh, leading to different areas. The digital image archive of medieval music. Now this is an example of sort of bringing collections out of the dark. You know, these collections are literally sitting in dark um, uh, enclosures not being seen by the public, not being used by people. Um, and this project was, was unique in the sense of providing money to image the medieval music that wouldn't get imaged normally. In other words, this stuff isn't pretty. Um, it may not even be intellectually important, but it is going to die very quickly if it isn't looked after, if it, is, if it doesn't have uh, 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 an image captured so we can have a record of it. This has been eaten, uh, that's rodent damage. Uh, this one here is quite interesting in that that was some medieval music which was found lining a hat box, uh, hence the strange shapes on oh, those lines. Um, and of course if we can do some high resolution images then there's all sorts of things that we can achieve by handing that off to uh, senior academics with some basic tools. So this is an example of a piece of music where the, uh, the acidic qualities of the ink has meant that notes on the other side have actually been burnt through to this side. So it's quite difficult for me as a layperson, not a musicologist, to look at this and go, well, which notes are on this side and which notes are not on this side from that. But we hand this high quality image with some basic tools to musicologists and they can come up with an opinion. They can say, well, we think these are the notes that should be viewed as being on this side. Of the, uh, of the page and so we can view that and that allows us to see if you like a before and after and to have an expression of a new, uh, new interest in that material. 
And it should be mentioned that the Diane resources, again talking about public engagement, I have come across examples of that being used in primary schools in Canada where teachers have picked up the materials and are using it as sheet music. It's free sheet music, so they're using it in teaching in primary schools in Canada. So, you know, there is, you know, uh, we often assume that if we're starting from a very highly scholarly place, that the only destination that will end up is a highly scholarly place. But actually, there are all sorts of scholars who are engaging with this at all sorts of different ages and all sorts of different purposes. Now, the, uh, the joys of, um, of PowerPoint mean that this lovely slide here, uh, where you can see that there is some text here, uh, but that the text at the top is obscured, uh, means that uh, you don't really get the full, full whammy here. But this is an image from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I was involved with, I mean, involved in over 500 digitization projects. And one of the projects was uh, the piloting of the digitization of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and so we took we were engaging with this uh, this fragment from the uh, from the scrolls, and as one can maybe see a little bit in this one, um, in this image you can you can see text here, but uh, in the top area you can't see that text. But if we apply infrared imaging uh, to that, uh, then we can get the ink to fluoresce in a different way from actually we're getting the parchment to fluoresce. And that allows us to see the ink, and that writing at the top there was 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 first seen uh, by us doing uh, this uh, doing this process, and so we had the privilege of being the first people for some two thousand odd years to be able to have read this text, um, and uh, uh, along that way. So there's all sorts of interesting things that imaging can do for us. We can throw uh, image uh, spectroscopy at things. Uh, this fragment here on the right is about the size of a, of a uh, cornflake and looks like it's a burnt cornflake. It's literally black, you cannot see anything on it at all. Um, and this is an infrared image. But then if we throw spectroscopy at it, you can tell the difference between the ink, the parchment upon which it is, the animal skin on which it is contained. This is actually Japan paper which has been stuck to the back of the um, to the back of the parchment to hold it together and then just the material that it is, is sat on it allows you to get a better registration of the text. So there's all sorts of things that we can do um, with imaging that will reveal and enable us to bring collections out of the dark and to be useful and seeable in different ways than they possibly would have been before. And we shouldn't underestimate that what we're doing here is also having an economic uh, impact. It is also bestowing some economic and community benefits. An example of both economic and community benefits is Glasgow Museum collections being digitised and made available, though they talk about the impact being to increase self-confidence in the populace, to make them feel less marginalised, less insignificant, less unheard, about increased feelings of self-worth through interaction with museums to spill over into every aspect of their lives. But it's also a little bit about, there's an aspect here of, of, of uh, making the most of your fiscal asset. So if you take the art collections and the museum collections of Glasgow, they're valued at about £1.4 billion. That's actually the similar sort of value to all of the private homes in Glasgow. But only about 2% when they started this collection, uh, this activity, were available to the public at any one time. So you can imagine what the public uproar would be if you said you can only live in 2% of the homes at any one time, but you got this asset which is worth as much money as all those homes, you could buy Glasgow with this collection. Isn't that an interesting, interesting concept? Only the public private housing, of course. Um, and so there's about that aspect of uh, uh, making for a, for, a, for a higher level of equality. And also we found that the Actives as Just Collections saved um, the HE sector about £43 million pounds per year. And all of our activities and all our engagements have a footprint as well. So you look at Liverpool, Univ Liverpool libraries, uh, they reckon that the existence of the National Libraries uh, Liverpool uh, generates about 2,500 jobs in the local community. Uh, because of their activities and so everything that we do you know whether we're a university or whether a museum or an archive we generate a footprint um, that is that is real and out there and 
from a, from a digital humanities perspective, I'm very keen on uh, anything that's interdisciplinary and collaborative. And so there are examples out there of unexpected uh, discoveries being achieved through digitization. So uh, when the freeze frame archive was digitized, they didn't think that that necessarily was going to have a great benefit to, um, uh, to uh, scientific studies of global warming and climate change. But of course, actually, you know, these were the first uh, humans who actually went and did scientific measurements. Uh, in those regions, and so it provides us with a baseline, you know, where you can show change from a point in time, a baseline which allows for, for change. And so, uh, as Penhado says, this, this has been invaluable in, cha in charting changes in polar regions. Those explorations and expeditions have been really valuable points of reference. Um, if I have time for a very silly story. Um, it's not a silly story in the sense it's just it's just it just amuses me. Um, one of the things that they brought back were um, uh, were uh, the skins of animals that they found in in in, in the Antarctic regions. And when uh, exploration was being done as to whether DDT was actually getting into uh, the uh, the atmosphere, uh, the water courses all of those aspects and they were trying to investigate whether it was having a big impact upon uh, uh, the global um, uh, global uh, environment. One of the things that they were able to do was pop down to the Antarctic, kill a penguin, uh, assess uh, the fat underneath the penguin skin and they were able to find that DDT was present in the skin and in the fat deposits of a penguin. And then they could look at the fat deposits of the skins that they'd been brought back from these Antarctic expeditions and demonstrate there was none in there at all. And so they could demonstrate this was a man-made thing that had been created and that reduced the use of DDT um, as, a, as an insecticide because it was shown to actually having that level of impact on the environment. So the need for us to have baselines where we can measure something from and to is quite important. And also if you're thinking about engagement, whether that is about any projects that you're involving, one of the things that's quite useful is to try and find out how things are before you start, so that you can measure what's being changed as you progress along, along an activity. Let's put it this way, it'd be really hard now, wouldn't it, to go back and say, what's the impact of email? We've had it for so long now, it'd be really hard to sort of make a really good measure now, 20 years, 30 years in, of what is the impact of, of, of email. And the same could be said for many digital resources. Often we only try and measure them after we've done something. And then the thing that we've done has made the change. We've, it's too late. We need to have a sort of before and after in that sense like that. It's also a useful thing to think about in terms of funding ideas, because some of your funding ideas may want, you wish, want, may want to show this is how it is now. What will it be in the future when we've succeeded and made a difference? Now I've shown you all the sort of like, you know, isn't it wonderful, aren't all digital resources extremely good? There is another way of looking at this. And Nat Talkington, who is a, uh, uh, who is a librarian in, in New Zealand, says, you want a massive digital collection, scan the sc stacks, you agonise over digital metadata and the purity thereof, and you offer crap access. If I ask you to talk about your collections, I know that you'll glow as you describe the amazing treasures you have. I think I've just been doing that, haven't I? When you go for money for digitization projects, you talk up the incredible cultural value. I think I've just been doing that as well. But then, if I look at the results of those digitization projects, I find the shittiest websites on the planet. It's like a gallery spent all its money buying art and then just stuck the paintings in supermarket bags and lent them against the wall. Now, you've probably been to websites where you've had that sensation, that feeling of them not really caring for the, the, the projects. You've probably also been to art galleries where they actually have done that as well. Um, but I'm not here to comment about the, the, the vagaries of modern art. Um, it's, 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 uh, there's, there's, there's a trap that can be experienced with digital, which is the assumption that if we do something with digitization involved, or if we do something that involves creating digital content, it will automatically be good. And we have to work harder than that. It's not quite true. And so there's an element here where I'd like to introduce the idea of the digital death spiral. And uh, I was inspired by this by, by a feature in, 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 uh, uh, in nature called the ant mill. 
and the ant lilies is uh, army ants. And army ants are, uh, their eyesight is really poor, but they have extremely strong uh, uh, sense of smell. They tend to communicate with each other by pheromones. And one of the things that army ants tend to do is, go, is lay a trap which says, food over here. And so they go and find the food, they run back and they go, look, food over here, and then everyone else follows them in that direction. And what can happen is you have this thing where you have someone who says, I'm following the guy in front because the guy in front is following this pheromone trail which says that there's food in this direction. And of course what you find is actually they're following their own pheromone trail and they end up going in circles. And you can actually have a situation where literally millions of ants will spend time just going round and round and round and round and round in circles until many of them will die. Um, from this process. And there is an equivalent here which is based on some assumptions. So how can we uh, uh, find out if we are in a di digital death spiral? Um, so what does a digital death spiral look like? Well the first thing is, is that digitization equals funding. If you're chasing digitization projects because of the funding, it's going to be one of the biggest mistakes you ever make. Um, you know, sometimes the worst news that you can get is, oh gosh, our funding proposal has been successful and now we've got to go and do this project which we put in at such a low amount of money because we thought that's what they would want it to be cheap and of course now we can't afford to make it and even if we did make it we then couldn't afford to maintain it or look after it or curate it into the future. And so the idea that digitization equals funding uh, is something that you have to sort of avoid uh, as being the reason why you're doing the digitization project. You need to have much stronger reasons for doing it than just because there will be money following it along. Uh, along. Um, digital is everything today, or who knows how much it will cost, but digital is bound to be wonderful. And this uh, aspect is, is, a, is a feature that we, uh, that we often came across. And, and there's a reason why that has gained some traction, these top three gained some traction. I've been in this game for many, many, many years. And of course, back in the late 90s, you literally could put a funding proposal together, which just had in its title, we're going to digitize stuff. And someone would have gone, here's money, you know, <laughs> go do it, you know, that aspect like this. And of course, that led to a, a sort of sense of, uh, of not really being as reflective or critical of what we were doing as, as need be. Now it's extremely hard to get money out of a research council for a digitization project. You can get money for doing scholarship, which maybe involves a bit of digitization, but you can't get money for a digitization project. It's quite hard, even though the Heritage Lottery Fund has said that it wants to fund some digitization to get money, which is a digitization project. No, you have to have a community project or a building project which has digitization around it. So the idea that digital is everything is being somewhat, somewhat built. Planning is so 20th century, let's be agile. Um, so the idea of, of, of agile programming, the idea that what we'll do is this iterative programming activity, which basically is built on the idea that we build a little bit, we have a look at it, it fails, we go, okay, that's okay, we can just, we, we'll just keep failing until we find a, a solution and we'll, iteratively, it will get better. Um, and therefore, we don't have to do any planning. And of course, the fallacy here is, is that when you look at that, um, it's often sold as this is what, this is what um, Microsoft do, or this is what IBM do, or this is what Twitter did, or Facebook did. And of course, actually, no, they do an immense amount of planning. They, they, they do go at things, and, and they will have, you know, your Google Fridays where you can play and those aspects, but there's still planning involved. They know when they fail why they failed, and that they're not going to do that again. So they don't just go off and try stuff and then go, oh, that was interesting, but I don't know why we got where we got to. They know why they got there, they know if they failed, why they failed, and then they use that to ensure that they don't fail in that way again. They may go off and fail in other ways, but not in that way. Because our competition, Google, my mate is doing it, possibly the other bet noir of my life is, 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 uh, is hearing that word. Well, my chief executive picked this book up on, on, on the way to the airport, and and said we should be doing it because Negroponte said that uh, you know um, uh, digital is free, or that we should be doing it because the, this other CEO is putting their collections into Google Art Project, or those aspects. These are all really bad reasons for doing something. Because uh, if we build it, they will come. Wonderful film, but it doesn't actually resolve 
anything to real life uh, around there. So how do we avoid uh, this digital um, death spiral? How do we avoid chasing our tails, thinking that things in the digital world are worth doing just because they're in the digital world? Um, and how do we maybe build some successful digital projects? So I'm just going to finish with some, some, uh, some top tips, if you like. Um, as I said, I've been involved in over 500 of these, these projects, so uh, this is coming from a well of great experience of failure as well as success. Uh, so I hope that my lesson, uh, and my failure, can be a lesson to you along the way. Uh, it very much depends upon the nature of the originals. You can imagine that your processes would be quite different if you're faced with 35 mil slides of photographs than you would be faced if you were faced with glass plate photographs, that your processes for imaging a uh, 12th century manuscript are going to be slightly different from what you would do if you were trying to um, image uh, several million um, uh, 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 checks, banking checks, you know. You know, and so your processes are going to be very much dependent. What's the nature of the originals? What can you physically do with them? How fast can you move them from one place to another? Um, how many people are going to be required in your process to look after them? Will you need to build conservation into your whole process, thinking about your originals? And of course, nature of the types of your content. Again, you know, handwritten materials. Well, they're not going to transcribe themselves. There's going to need to be a process of people engaging with that content to maybe make that content available. The Fine Rolls Henry III is a very good example where we've had to actually calendar all of that content so that it could be searchable. The images will not automatically become searchable. Latin will not automatically become accessible to an English uh, speaking uh, audience. There needs to be uh, processes there. And of course, if you're dealing with image and visual content, you've got a whole range of issues that come up there in terms of the nature of that content how you're going to describe it, how much is enough description. And one of the problems that we often have is that we describe visual content in ways that sort of suit us but don't really suit the person who's uh, trying to access them. Um, and this is where maybe some of that entertainment aspects get lost, you know. So we have a picture and we go, oh, I know, uh, it's really important that that duckbill picture of a duckbill platypus is indexed under monotremes because that's its species name, etc., 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 and we should put in all our scientific names, etc. And it kind of doesn't allow for the kid coming in saying, "Have you got any funny-looking Australian animals?" You know, uh, and so um, you know, they think funny. Uh, and so we need to think about the types of content and then how we're going to express that. And our information and scholarly needs, how we're going to engage with those things. Project manager's dilemma, everyone wants everything to be uh, wonderful and beautiful and a fabulous product that costs very little and is available almost immediately. But you'll find yourself sat around tables wondering why you can't have those things and it's because you can only have two of those at most. Um, if you want it to, to be uh, wonderful and available immediately, get your checkbook out. It's going to cost you a large amount of money. And similarly, you can make all sorts of combinations around those. And this is one of the things that we often find is, is that we're sat there and the argument's going round and round and round the table. And until we actually engage with the aspect that we've got to compromise on one of these, it, that's the only point where we start to actually start solving the problem that we have in front of us if we're thinking about it in a project type context. Remember that planning and communication are essential. My favourite quote about planning is that it's an unnatural process. It's much nicer to just get on with the job. Failure then comes a complete surprise instead of being preceded by a period of worry and doubt. Um, but also look at these numbers. Uh, when KPMG looked at why do technology projects fail, particularly the really big ones, you know, why, do, why did the BBC spend £98 million on a digital asset management system that didn't manage digital assets? You know? Why did the UK government spend £9 billion on an, on an attempt to digitise all our health records and didn't actually manage to digitise those? Why did they fail? Is it because of the technology? And they will go on about it's the technology, it's the technology, it's the technology. And that's the people. It's always the people. It's about lack of project management and control, lack of communication, failure to define objectives. 
So you can look at those which cover you know, 50, 60, two thirds of the problems that you're facing here. And what you've got is, a, is an issue of, well, failure to define objectives. We didn't know where we were going. And even if we did know where we were going, we wouldn't know how to get there because we don't really talk to each other. So we'd all have got there at a different amount of time. And frankly, we didn't have good project management and control. And the old saying, which is that if you don't have a plan, any pathway will take you there, is true. And it's about your ecosystem. So imagine the world as a digital resource made of content and users and stakeholders, people you care about and will benefit from the resort activity being made about how we're going to trade with each other, about the legal frameworks, copyright, etc., that we're, that we're living within, the technology platforms and infrastructures, our links to other digital resources. Are we able to actually show how all those things are going to interact with each other? Because we're all existing within an ecosystem which will have a number of holistic links across and around those elements. And if we don't know, think about our ecosystem, if we can't answer those questions about how we engage and link with those other aspects, we're going to struggle um, with um, uh, 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 planning a decent project but also delivering a decent project. But there's also some, some interesting, real fundamental uh, thinking that we need to accept. We think of scholarship in terms of uh, this uh, uh, expression of uh, actions and engagements that John Unsworth talked about in, in his seminal um, paper, Scholarly Primitives, where he said that what scholars do uh, is uh, discovering, annotating, comparing, referring, sampling, illustrating, and representing. They do a number of other things as well, but these were some of the core things that he felt were a feature of being a scholar, you know, that these were things that you do. And I think you could take scholarship out of the centre of that, that diagram and put just people. Um, because if you look at what people do online and how they express themselves, they may not be doing it at the refined level that a scholar is doing it, or at the depth that a scholar is doing. But almost, every, almost anything that we do, we're very engaged with discovery, obviously. Google search engines out there. We're very interested in annotating, commenting on things, liking stuff, all those aspects. Comparing, compare the meerkat.com, no, comparing uh, digital resources and saying this one's better than that one, referring and saying, look, have you seen this? Have you, have you engaged with that? Sampling and reusing that on YouTube and other aspects, illustrating, representing, all of these types of activities are what people do. So one of the aspects here is also to sort of free ourselves from the concept that what scholars do is so utterly different from what an average person uh, on the street does uh, in those aspects. And so there's elements here about maybe the advantage of setting our data free, thinking about open access, about uh, uh, making, if you like, our wine available in a multitude of glasses rather than assuming that our wine should only be available in our glass uh, and maybe making it freely available. You can see the uh, opportunities that have come from um, uh, crowdsourcing. So Transcribe Bentham is a, is a great example. Uh, one of my favourites is the uh, New York Public Library uh, which has a uh, crowdsourcing project to um, uh, to actually uh, uh, transcribe all of the uh, menus that they have in their in their collections, they've digitised their menus. Now they're transcribing them, so you can now go and actually do a search where you find what the cost of a lo open lobster salad sandwich would be, and compare that cost of a open lobster salad sandwich across a number of uh, environments. So these sorts of these sorts of elements, but also. If you look at, say, the fun things that the Welsh Newspapers Online have done, which, where they've said from the National Library of Wales, we're going to make a number of millions of uh, pages available, but then we're going to open up the API so that you can come and create within our content and build things and do things. So here's an example of just something that's fun. So on a hack day that they had where people came up with ideas, one of the things that you get in newspapers is that when you digitise them to enable you to actually index all those words, you actually have a little coordinate thing which allows you to sort of take a word and say this is a word. And so this is a system where the idea is, is that actually what you can do is you can just type out your ransom note 
and then this, the API will go to the, the archive and pull those words from random newspapers and then present them uh, as proposed. The ransom then saves all that cutting out and pasting in thing that's just so annoying when you're trying to do your ransom notes. And so here we have the wonderful thing, I've kidnapped your foul mouth parrot and et cetera, et cetera. That's just fun, isn't it? It's fun, but it's, it's the sort of thing that if you make your data available to someone else, they can come up with ideas that you would never come up with yourself and build content and use around, around that. This is the sort of thing that would really get kids engaged and having a good time with this sort of material. So one of the things that I've been working on is trying to go beyond that sort of what are the values and benefits to thinking about well, how would we actually measure impact, how would we measure a measurable change in the life or life opportunity of those people who are engaging with and using digital resources. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this uh, here, it may come out in the discussion afterwards. Um, but basically, you know, if a digital resource is being used, is there a change occurring? Is there a measurable change in behaviour, a measurable change in opportunity? Um, in, and are those wider sets of opportunities now available to that personal community? Are we able to measure beyond the idea that here is an activity that leads to some outputs? So instead of measuring digitization projects by saying, look, we digitized some newspapers and now there are 9 million pages of newspaper available, we look to the next stage, which is we say, well, what's the outcomes? What's changed by people using those, those resources? So now those newspapers being available in every school uh, anywhere in the world who wants them, but mostly maybe say in Wales. So is that leading to a change in, uh, in children's appreciation of sense of place, sense of community, their ability to read the Welsh language, those sorts of aspects like this. You know, does that uh, outcome then lead to potential impacts? Does the opportunity to make those newspapers available to everyone, wherever they are, mean that we can have an economic benefit as an outcome in terms of instead of 250,000 people over 20 years accessing newspapers, we've got 250,000 people every day accessing newspapers and they're not having to travel to Aberystwyth, which is about six hours from here, um, if, you, if you wanted to get access to the materials. And that's an economic benefit that can be put to those specific communities. So are we actually having those, those benefits? And just to emphasize that there are a number of areas of impact because uh, we often get very caught up in this idea that the only impacts that we can pro possibly have are economic ones, that it's all about can we make people rich and wealthy. The Department for Culture, Media and Sport have just released a couple of uh, reports um, uh, and which talk about the, uh, the impact of, uh, on social um, the social impact of uh, culture, media and sport, or have looked at the health and well, well-being impact of culture, media and sport. And do you know that they've actually estimated that going to your library makes you feel happier than going and spending time doing sport? I think it's good. So all sorts of interesting um, thoughts there are around about these different areas of impact in terms of, yes, we can be economic in generating wealth, but maybe it's all about, maybe there's also issues of equality and equity. And equity is one of the four main uh, areas of, of, uh, uh, of impact that the British Council look at when they're uh, engaging in assessments of, of how they're, they're doing. But this process of thinking about impact can be uh, quite exacting. It can take a lot of time and energy. It can also take a fair amount of resources. Uh, it's not going to be for everyone to go into the depths of doing a full in impact assessment. And so there's going to be some questions that we need to know. What do I want to assess? Why do I want to assess that? And most importantly, when I get the results, what am I going to do with them? What are they for? How are they going to be purposeful and helpful along the way? Uh, and so, uh, as I this this is available uh, all of these things are available uh, for free. The full report is available there. And so having sort of taken you on a journey where I've talked about some of the benefits of digitized resources, 
and then talks about some of the pitfalls of digitised resources, and then talks about was well, how can you get yourself out of those pits that you've dug yourself, because it did look like a wonderful thing to do, um, and then relating that to impact. So how can we then show that what we've done has made a difference to our communities? Um, that's really the sort of journey that I want to take you on. Um, I tweet at Simon Tanner. I blog at my blog spot um, when the data hits the fan. Uh, thanks to Alice Mags for the, for, the, for the lovely impact illustrations that are being used throughout. Um, a number of these uh, presentations and this content are available on SlideShare, so if you didn't get a chance to make notes, just go look at my SlideShare account and you'll find uh, a number of materials that are available uh, there, which will be very similar in some respects, you know, um, uh, to some of the content that's here. Or if you want to particularly look in more depth at the impact agenda, then there's a lot of material there on the slideshow as well. So thank you very much. I think there's time for a chat, isn't it?